the groundhog glide, I think we're going to get spring early. This is pretty good. Uh, welcome, everyone. I applaud you for making God a priority today. And we've got some beautiful flowers here for um, some different family members, Pat and your son, right? They're your son's birthday. And then we have Melvin for Phyllis's birthday. So we've got some beautiful flowers. It's in the bulletin, too. If I wanted to point that out, especially the people online would be able to know that then. And I'm not going to go through the announcements, because if you get the midweek, and there's some of them that are in the bulletin, you have all those announcements, and actually they play before the service starts, too. Uh, especially for folks online, if you would like to have our midweek, which would have all our announcements, especially the Lent and Easter services coming up, so you can understand what's going on, call the church. Do it right now, 812-522-1137. Leave a message, we'll call you back, and you can give us the details so we can make sure we get it to you. I think it's important, especially if you attend with us regularly, that you are connected with us and you understand what's going on, and you know how to reach me, because I would like to be your pastor, not just someone that talks to you on Sundays, okay? Um, new prayer concerns, you know, Wendy Pearson's surgery went well last week. She's now at Covered Bridge. She would love cards, visits, anything. She would love those. Uh, so please be aware of that, Covered Bridge. And we had a few other surgeries this week that's kind of low key that happened. All went well. Um, for those who haven't done so yet, if you brought some tithes and offerings with you, put it in the tray in the back. We do not pass the plate here because of COVID. We've just eliminated that for a while. So there's a plate in the back that you can put your money in. For those online, go on to your online banking and just send money over to 201 East 3rd Street for Seymour First United Methodist Church. Or you can just mail a check in to 201 East 3rd Street. 3rd Street. Whatever works best for you. But this is that time, this is one of my favorite times, because I, like you, have been doing things this morning, getting ready. Now is when we get to get settled in our seat and get comfortable. Take a deep breath and prepare our hearts and mind for worship as Judy uses her wonderful gifts and plays the prelude.
And now we'll go to the call to worship. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Take delight in the Lord. And now if you'll join me for the gathering prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your ways or trusted your promises. Forgive us, Lord, and fill our hearts with your selfless love. You alone can turn evil into good, sorrow into rejoicing, and death into everlasting life. Teach us your way of grace to meet hatred with kindness, to answer curses with blessing, to give without expectation of return, and to love without holding back. In the name of Jesus, we humbly pray. Amen.
seated. Kids want to come down? I have candy. <laughs> I know how to do that. I have candy. Just have a seat over there, and we're kind of spaced apart from you a little bit. Do you guys remember if we had a holiday this week? Hmm. What was the holiday? Valentine's Day. What happens on Valentine's Day? You get candy. Do you pass out Valentine's to anybody else? Who'd you pass out Valentine's to, sir? To, to your friends? Did you do it everybody in your class or just some of your friends? Everybody in your class? Good. I'm glad you did that because you know everyone needs a Valentine, don't they? Everyone needs to know that they are loved. Well, you know what? When I open up my Bible, guess what I found? What do you think those are? They're Valentine's. And my Valentines have scripture on them. One of them says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Luke 10, 27. And the other one says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. And that's Proverbs 3, 5. You know, these are words from the Bible. And scriptures are given to us just like we give Valentine's to everyone in our class a lot of times, and other people in our family, because we want to share that love. We want to tell other people about that love, don't we? Okay, well, this week, I want you to think about that. Think about, you know, that you gave a Valentine to maybe even somebody who wasn't really that kind to you. Am I right? Sometimes we give a Valentine out to someone who's not real kind to us. What do you think that does to that person? makes them happy, you will find, at least my experience, if someone is a grumpy person or unkind to others or they're a bully, there's something usually happening in their family. And they are used to people ignoring them and treating them bad, and when someone still treats them good anyway, it changes them a little bit. Kind of like the Grinch at Christmas. When he realized it wasn't all about toys and stuff, it was so much bigger. And Valentine's Day is so much bigger. It's more about love. And for me, I was so excited to see my Valentine's because they were about God's love. So I've got Valentine's here for each of you. Okay, the crunch bars. Okay, you want to pass them down? And then I have a task for you to do. There are five crunch bars in here and the rest are candy. I want you guys to give a Valentine or a piece of candy to every single person here and then go upstairs do the ones upstairs. Can you do that? You can split it up if you like. Whatever you want to do. Get busy passing out Valentines. You may have to spread out and conquer. Do whatever works easiest for you. There's enough for you guys up there, too. It's okay. You're going to get one, too. While they're passing that out, I'm going to do a quick prayer for these kids. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in praise. We love children. Children are in our midst because often they remind us what Jesus said, that you need to be like children. Because when children see things so much more clearly than we do, we let the world cloud our vision. Thank you for children in our life, and we ask you to bless the children here and the children online at this time. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Don't worry, they're going to get to you. Now we're going to do the invitation and thanksgiving for tithes and offering. 
Children of the Most High God, in obedience to Jesus' words to love others as we love ourselves, do good, bless and pray for friends and enemies alike, let us now do to others as we would have done to us, offering our tithes and gifts for the sake of our sisters and brothers in need. Usher, please present the tithes and offerings. Holy God, you have given us land in which to grow and thrive, food for survival and pleasure, air and water, fire and cold. Make our tithes and offerings today bloom forth into the lives of others in the name of the one who gave everything for us. Amen. do the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, by your word, you provide all we need for salvation, for wholeness, for abundant life. Now draw us close in your spirit so that we may discover your will and live according to your purposes. Speak, Lord, we, your servants, are listening. Amen. And now the morning scripture comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Love your enemies. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from who you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and your, you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And our scripture reading continues in Genesis, Genesis 45. Genesis 45, 3 through 11. And then 15, listen for the word of God. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his, uh, his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brother, brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing 
nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord to all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall saddle, settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, I often hear a saying, usually I hear it when someone's been in an accident or they've um, lost someone in their family. I often will hear, well, everything happens for a reason. I gotta be honest, I cringe a little when I hear that. Because when it's said, it implies that God causes everything and there's a reason. God caused that to happen and there's a reason. And today I want to push back on that claim and kind of explain why. And this scripture is one of the reasons why sometimes people say that. You know, when we say that everything happens for a reason, it implies that God wanted Trey Hohenstrider to have leukemia. But Jesus taught us that is not the case. God does not want us to suffer. When we say everything happens for a reason, it implies that God wanted some of the people who died of COVID to die of COVID. Once again, Jesus teaches us that God does not want us to suffer and that he loves each and every one of us. It conflicts with what Jesus has taught. However, the scripture has been used as a weapon as people in, for, against people in the past. It was even used to explain why it was okay to go capture people in Africa and bring them to the United States as slaves. We were saving them. Everything happens for a reason. Well, through the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, today I want you to walk away understanding two things. God does not want bad things to happen to you. Jesus taught us that really want that to stick with you. And number two, but when bad things do happen, God can take anything bad and turn around and create, create something good out of it. Now before we dig further, I want to kind of share some experience I've had with people who believe everything happens for a reason. And that way you can kind of see why it makes me cringe a little. I have someone I know, and I'm sure that you have too, um, I have a man that I know who is adamant God caused his divorce. He quit going to church. He used to go to church every Sunday. He quit going to church. He doesn't believe in God anymore because why would I want to believe in such an awful being that would do such awful things? Because you've got to understand in his situation, his wife was in a terrible accident. And uh, she healed physically but not mentally. And as a recall, re result, it was a strain to their relationship, and then eventually they did have a divorce. And he is positive God caused that. And as a result, he doesn't want to come to church anymore. He doesn't blame the person who had caused the accident. I, think, I do believe they were drunk. He doesn't blame himself or his wife for the divorce. Why? Because, as he says, everything happens for a reason, God wanted this to happen. Hmm. But Jesus doesn't teach that. It's easy to do, though, isn't it? I don't know about you. I'm guilty of this. 
sometimes I slide into this, I will know a person who is absolutely terrible. They are mean to people, they hoard their money, they won't share anything with anyone, and they try to make people miserable. And when they get cancer, there's a little piece of me that wants to say, good, you finally gave them what they deserved. But that isn't the case. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. That just isn't the case. But sometimes it feels good to say that, to be able to just blame it on God. But in that first scripture reading that Jacqueline read from Luke, Jesus is teaching us to love our enemies, be kind to those who are unkind to us, even says, pray for those who abuse you. Like I said, God doesn't want bad things to happen to us. He never promised a problem-free life. Nowhere in the Bible did God, Jesus, Paul, anyone say, you will have a problem-free life when you become a Christian. Actually, whenever I baptize adults, I will often say, I need you to understand the next three months will probably be very hard on you. You need to understand, or if they're preparing to get baptized, or if they're preparing to go to walk to Emmaus, these will be your toughest times because Satan doesn't want this to happen and will be attacking harder than ever. You need to understand this. Be prepared. God never promised a problem-free life, but God promises to be with us throughout that life. And repeatedly we see in the Bible when God takes something bad and turns around and creates something good. Now, for those of us who are not real familiar with Genesis, let me kind of explain a little bit about this for you, okay? The book of Genesis is full of sibling rivalry. Think about it. Cain and Abel, sibling rivalry. You know, one brother kills another. How about an older brother mocking the younger brother, Ishmael and Isaac? That's also in Genesis. A twin deceiving his twin brother in Jacob and Esau. A pair of sisters in such a fierce rivalry to have more children forced their servants into surrogacy. And that was Rachel and Leah. And prior to our story today, a younger son is sold into slavery by his older brothers. Now, to kind of catch everybody up, so you can understand where it comes from. Abraham. Jacob is a grandson of Abraham. He has 12 children. And remember, he worked 14 years to get Rachel as his wife, who he loved dearly. Even though he had 12 sons, the two that she had, he gave special attention to, especially Joseph. And there's even you know, a musical about it, Joseph and the Technicolor Raincoat. Rain Raincoat or something like that, I forget what it's called. But anyway, you know, he even gave Joseph this beautiful, colorful coat and didn't do anything for the other, other sons. Gee, I wonder why they were a little angry at him. And then to add insult to injury, Joseph was arrogant. He was an arrogant kid, a tattletale, an arrogant. So his dad would send him out and say, tell me what's going on. Kind of set him up, didn't he? In a way. Well, anyway, he would share his dreams with the family. And it actually got to the point it ticked off even his dad. Because his dreams would say that he was going to be superior to them. Well, long story short, his brothers get really angry. One day they have an opportunity. They're going to kill him. Then they talk them into putting him into a pit. And then a caravan goes by and they sell him into slavery, take that beautiful, colorful coat, rip it up, get blood on it, and take it back to their dad and said a wild animal got a hold of him. And they hadn't thought it through because their dad mourned deeply for his son. And all along, they're having to deal with the fact they sold their own brother into slavery. And, and the great thing about Genesis, if you read Genesis and you go back like to I think it's 34, and you go all the way to 50. Honestly, break out your Bible this week. Read that part of Genesis. The whole story's there, okay? 
Genesis 37 tells us that Joseph is 17 when he's sold into slavery. All sorts of things happened in Egypt, included times when he was trusted and treated well, and times when he was not trusted and he was unjustly imprisoned. Then Genesis 41 tells us 13 years later, when he's 30, he becomes second in command in Egypt, second to Pharaoh. And after that, there's seven years of harvest plenty, and then there's two more years of famine. Okay, so we are now where he's 39. 22 years he's been separated from his family. Let that sink in a little. 22 years. Joseph was robbed of his time with his father and family for 22 years. We could focus on those trials and tribulations he had during that time. But first I want to ask you, how old are you today? <coughs> Subtract 22 years and think about where you were 22 years ago. And just think someone significant to you was robbed of you. And for 22 years, you had to endure whatever you had to endure. Would you be angry? Would you want revenge? How about his brothers? Not all the brothers wanted him harmed. Remember, Reuben was trying to do something to save him. And when it was done and he was already sold into slavery, it was too late. They saw their father mourn deeply for 22 years. And they had to live with that guilt for 22 years. Now in our scripture, the brothers are here. This is actually the second time they're in front of, of their brother and they don't know it. They're before him asking for food. They're bringing money with them to get food. And Joseph tells them, I am your brother, Joseph. Well, 22 years, you change a lot, and Egyptians wore a lot of makeup. 22 years later, are they elated to see him? <clears throat> Scared to death, aren't they? Scared to death! Worse yet, do they, they, do they have to tell their father the truth now? You see, Joseph in the scripture eases their pain by saying, it's okay, God did this. He really didn't believe God did this. Go back on chapter 50 and you'll see he'll flat out tell them, you sold me into slavery. He doesn't even mix the words, you did sell me into slavery. He hasn't forgiven them yet. But when he speaks to them this first time, he eases it a little bit and says, you know, it's okay. God was able to use this in an important way. God didn't make Joseph arrogant. God didn't make his brothers jealous and angry. God didn't sell Joseph into slavery. Joseph knows this, but he's trying to ease it because he wants to see his dad and his brother. And I caution here, because once again, we hear everything happens for a reason. And in this scripture, this piece of scripture, he's alluding to that. Later on, you hear him tell the real story. And the reason why we say this, this is definitely a Wesleyan tradition you need to understand. Because free will exists. God gave us free will. And when we say everything happens for a reason, it can be very harmful. You know, Adam and Eve used their free will to do what God told them not to do. If a person gets drunk and then hits another car, they're using their free will. When someone robs another person, they're using their free will. We have sinful arrogance, Lord knows I still do. <coughs> Jealousy, that we like to blame God. I always hate this in, um, Insurance companies, when they say it's an act of God, when really if you look at it, it wasn't an act of God. You can go look deeper. Someone builds houses on the side of a mountain and they remove all the vegetation, and five years later they have a mudslide. That's not an act of God. You removed all the vegetation on the side of a mountain. When it's going to rain a lot, you will have a mudslide. 
But good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. But Joseph was arrogant. His brothers were jealous. Instead of everything happens for a reason, I suggest that the more accurate way to put it is God can take bad and create good from it. And you know what the best news is? Here's the good news. We serve a Lord that never stops loving us, ever. No matter what we do, what we do to someone else, no matter what, no matter what happens to us, God never stops loving us. We serve a Lord that does not want bad things to happen. Jesus describes this again and again and again in the Gospels. You see, when we face difficult circumstances, God can use that. God can use it to change us. God can use it to change the circumstances of another group of people. God can use it to change an entire nation's situation. And in this case, he was able to feed his chosen people because they were going to starve to death in Canaan. Once again, read Genesis 37 through 50 this week. You'll get the whole story. You'll get the rest of the story. But the good news is, no matter what situation we're in, God's love never ends. You know, this rings so strongly with me, because in 2012, my father had a heart attack. November 2012, right after Thanksgiving. He had to have a quadruple bypass, and it did not go well. He had to have two more major surgeries in a three-month period of time, and normally when you have a quadruple bypass, you're in ICU a couple of days, they send you to a room, they start having your um, rehab for your heart, and you go home. My dad spent three months in ICU. And during that time, there was times we wondered if he was going to survive. There really was a period of time we started talking about the funeral. We didn't know if he was going to make it. But do you know... What my sisters and I found, especially me during that time, I kept hearing the song, I will praise you in this storm. Because there was a storm going on in our lives, but God was still there. God never promised we were going to live in a rose garden. We weren't in a rose garden. We were sitting and living in an ICU. Literally, I had a computer there. I worked. I did the U.S. Navy account from ICU in Columbus. Because we didn't know how long he was going to be there. But God was there all the time. And we don't have time today, but man, I can tell you all the good that God created out of that time. There's another man in hope who had hope during that time because we were in that hospital. There were other people's lives that were changed because we were in a place we didn't want to be. But God could take the this bad situation and do something good with it. It happens, guys. It happens all the time. And the reason I want to share that is I think it's important for us to understand our good news that no matter what situation we're in, no matter what bad situation we may be in, God's love never ends. Never ends. So remember, two things I want you to remember today. God does not want bad things to happen to us. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus shares that. And number two, God can take anything bad and create something good. You know, God is the creator, right? He can take something bad and create something good. And there isn't a reason for everything. Please try not to say that because you have no idea how many people are going home and shutting their door in tears because what they're hearing is God did this to you and you deserved it. They go home with a person with cancer thinking, God did this to me. What did I do to deserve it? And then sometimes they walk away from their faith. Or they hear someone say that and their family member died of COVID and they think God is a tyrant for killing his people. Or like my friend, who is convinced God caused his divorce, 
and God can go to hell for it. That's how he feels. And there's no changing his mind now. Well, I'm still working on it. Anyway, God does not want bad things to happen to us. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus teaches us that. And God can take anything bad and create good from it. That's our good news today. They know how to finish a job, by golly, don't they? <laughs> Good job, kids. During this time of silence, this is that time when you can just take some time, like 30 seconds, to be alone with the Lord. Discuss what's on your mind, what spoke to you today. Maybe it was in the liturgy and the call to worship. Maybe it was one of the prayers. Maybe it was one of the songs. Whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit moves in mysterious ways. Take some time now. And just speak with the Lord a little bit before we move in to the prayer. Our intercessory prayer today. When I say, God, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Holy God, your cross stands before us as a light that shows us our failures and salvation through your Son. We thank you for forgiving us, for coming among us to heal our pain and resentments. We yearn for your word and praise you for your love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A giver of prayer that groans within us, teach us to pray for our enemies. Their names are many, and right now we whisper some of them now before you in our hearts. Be with them. Guard our enemies from harm. Guide them in the way of your light. And sometimes, Lord, we're the ones that you send to guide them. Open our hearts to that action. Save us from self-righteousness and help us to begin our lives anew. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal the night, nations, mighty God. Reign peace on all the people, especially those in Russia and the Ukraine. 
Give hope to the hopeless and love to the lonely. Surprise the leaders of all nations with your joy. For the people who live with the threat of war, who live by those who oppress them instead of caring for them, who cry out for rescue, who cry out for reconciliation and plenty on their behalf. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We beg comfort for the sick, O oh God. Make whole the broken, make wise the foolish, humble the powerful, make glad the hearts of those who tend our loved ones. And for any who are in pain, give them release, healing, but also give them rest, Lord. Speak love to those on our prayer list or who have asked for prayer, but also to those who cry out silently. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Savior of the world, we give thanks for the biblical witness of Joseph and his brothers and stories rich enough to feed us because they were not perfect people either. Make us truly grateful for prophets and the dreamers amongst us. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting in the mercy of your never failing wisdom, we commend it to your hands all for whom we pray. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises. leaning on the everlasting arms. When I die, if one of those songs are sung, everybody needs to weave back and forth, okay? Just to let you know, just giving you a free warning, you know, I like to plan things out. Okay, I invite you to stand up, because you're already standing up. Open your eyes, arms wide for the blessing. 
Now may the Lord, who gave Joseph tears of joy at the reunion with his family, surround your days with strong visions, worthy work to create good out of bad, reconciliations and the strength to persevere. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.